morning. I'm Rule Osley today. See my name tag? So, uh, the, yeah, the B string is here again. So it's uh, good to be here with you in his, in his, trying to wear his shoes today. But I was thinking as I was telling people I was Rule Osley, I'm thinking, no cooking, no cleaning. Hey, this is going to be all right. <laughs> uh, he does a lot of things, but there's some things he just doesn't do, and it's probably a good thing. Um, it is so exciting having our boys and girls with us today in our service. I was thinking when I woke up this morning and wondered what in the world the weather would be like. I was remembering a, a memory, boys and girls, when I was about your age. One morning I woke up, I lived in Kansas, and I looked out the window, and there had been a blizzard that night. So I asked my mom, Mom, are we going to church? And she said, we always go to church. And we did. So I put, I got, I got to wear pants that day, which was a first. I pulled on my rubber boots. And because we knew the car could not make it down the, the, down the street in all the snow, Mom sent us out one by one, my older brother first, and we all followed along. Um, I was little, but the snow was above my knees and above my boots. So I told mom I didn't know what I was going to do, and she said, one car has rolled down the street so far, so just get in that track. And I walked all the way to church, about a mile, like this, going down that little one track in the road. Now, we knew there was church because the pastor lived across the street, and we'd already seen him walking to church. So we got there, um, all my little brothers, and mom carried the baby in her arms because the stroller wouldn't roll on the snow. And when we got there, there were only two families at church. No children's church, no Sunday school like here today. And, um, but guess what? We got to eat all the donuts. It was great. It was great. But you know what? That made an indelible impression on me because my mom said, we always go to church. Worship of God was a stable foundation in our home. We made no excuses. We made no exceptions. We were going to be there, and we got the sermon that day nonetheless. So it was great. And so, boy or girl, if you're with your mom or dad and sitting next to them, would you take their hand right now and do a little squeeze? Thank you. Just twice. Thank you. Might be your grandma or grandpa for bringing you to church this morning because they're teaching you something very important by their example. We go to church. In fact, this is a pretty good crowd for a hurricane weekend, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm just glad it rained because I thought, oh, we're going to look like fools if, if the sun is shining this morning. <clears throat> I'm standing in Rule's uh, shoes this morning because he was to fly out this afternoon to Asbury Seminary. Um, he has alumni council meetings up there this week in Kentucky, and um, he was afraid a couple days ago that he wouldn't be able to get out today. It looked like all the flights would be closed down. They may still be. And uh, so he was able to get the last seat on a flight yesterday afternoon. So he buzzed on out of here, and so I was staying up till 11, 12 o'clock last night working on his sermon. So here it is, and uh, it's, it's always a privilege to be in this pulpit. Um, probably the most exciting thing about what Rule is doing this week, though, is he gets to speak in Asbury Seminary Chapel. Now, you know, to go to the place where you went to college for four years and then stayed three more for seminary, and to be in that place where all the great moments of your life happen, in that chapel where the Holy Spirit met you again and again and again, to have the privilege of going back and being part of another holy moment it's just over the top for us. And so I'm so happy for him and proud for him. He last preached in that pulpit when he was 24. So it's been a while. He was elected one of the seniors to be um, invited to preach there during the last week of our senior year. And that was a great privilege. Uh, he will tell you that he, he nearly passed out in the pulpit that day. He was so excited and nervous, um, but he's going to be back on Wednesday. I was there the first time, and I plan to be there this time. I'll be watching by streaming uh, internet. So if any of y'all would like to join me from your own homes or business places, just uh, Google Asbury Seminary and go on their website. I'm sure there's a link you can click uh, to watch the streaming video. It'll be 10 o'clock this Wednesday morning. So it ought to be something special to see and be a part of. 
Um, so I'm him today, and I wanted to talk about gazing beyond but glancing behind. You know, I believe we should always gaze where our priorities are, but we always need to glance and see where we've come from. So I want to spend a few minutes glancing behind. And a lot of you haven't been Methodist all your life. Um, we have so many great traditions in our family here. We've got Baptists and Catholics and Presbyterians and, and Pentecostals, and it's, it's great. We love it. But I wanted to uh, have a lot of people who say to me, are we going to have a Methodist class? And uh, the answer is yes, right now. So, boys and girls, I brought the father of Methodism with me today. This is John Wesley himself in the form of a little doll. John Wesley um, traveled uh, all over the known world in his day uh, preaching the gospel, particularly Britain and America. But now we take him all over the world with us. And he went to the Congo recently with Rule, and you will see many uh, pictures in Rule's Congo pictures of John Wesley sitting on his shoulder or near him experiencing all the different mission works where Methodism is strong around the world. Well, there was a man back in the 1800, 18th century, 1700s, named George Whitfield, and he was a great great, incredible revival preacher. He traveled all over Britain and America. In fact, he was probably the number one most well-known personality of his day, even more popular than presidents, because he verbally, literally spoke to millions of people in open-air situations. Now, George Whitfield had been mentored by Mr. John Wesley. They were students together at Oxford in Britain, in England. And John Wesley had what he called his holy club, and he was mentoring and discipling young men in the faith. And George Whitfield was one of those men. So they were very close friends, even though they were very divergent in their theology. And um, John Wesley was doing some very creative and innovative things and, and saw some great truths from scriptures. And because of that, the door and pulpits of the church where he grew up, the Anglican church, were not open to him. He was not allowed to preach in the churches that he was, that was his home. And this was of great panic to him, a great source of uh, sorrow. So George Whitfield, who was already preaching all around about, said, John, just get out there and take the church to the people. Just get out there and go take the church where the people are. Don't wait for the people to come to you. This just seemed like heresy to John Wesley. He was like, oh my gosh, I can't do that. I've grown up in these high church, established, traditional settings. Oh, you know, God might strike me dead if I walk out the door and preach in the streets and in the fields. But what John experienced was people were hungry and people were coming. People who would never step foot inside those, you know, high, those high strung, those traditional settings would listen to the message of Jesus where they lived, where they felt comfortable. So John took the word to the people. And George Whitfield was taken to the word to the people and one of the greatest revivals this nation has ever experienced came about as a result of that. Now, you and I don't hear a whole lot about George and John anymore, but I'm telling you, your life every day and my life has changed because of how God used these two men. And that's part of our Methodist heritage and we should be proud of it together. So, <clears throat> I think, why do I share this today? Because we're in the middle of the Beyond campaign. And even though we're looking beyond, I want us to take a glance back and see where we've come from. George and God told John Wesley, take the church to the people. Take the message to the people. And that's what the multi-site movement is. That's what we're wanting to do as well. Take it to the people. Turn in your Bible, if you will, to the book of Mark. Um, you know the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books in the New Testament. Mark is the second one. All these four books are firsthand eyewitness accounts of Jesus' ministry when he walked on this earth. And I want you to turn to the um, 16th chapter of Mark, which is the last chapter. 
And these are very important words. In fact, in my opinion, these are some of the most important words in Scripture because of what they are. Boys and girls, we know that Jesus uh, was crucified on a cross. He died, and then he rose from the dead. He came alive again, proving once and for all, for all eternity, that he indeed was God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But he didn't just go straight to heaven. Before he ascended to heaven, he hung around for a few days, and he talked to many people, and many people saw him. So there were eyewitness accounts that Jesus indeed had risen from the dead. And before he left, he gave a message to his 11 disciples, the 11 of the 12 that were left. And he told them, he gave them their marching orders. He told them what he wanted them to do. Now, y'all know when someone's dying and we think we won't see them again, we will travel great distances to see someone we love for the very last time. And the words they speak to us are powerful, poignant words because they might well be the last words we ever hear from them. I remember, even though my father wasn't dying, I still remember the last words he spoke to me. He just said, Lisa, I love you, and I'm very, very proud of you. I'm proud that you are serving Jesus with your life. I will treasure that and remember that forever because he died of a heart attack a few months later when he was back home and away from me. So those last words are special, and these are Jesus' last words, chapter 16, verse 15, and I'm reading this from the message. Jesus says, you're to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone everywhere. I like that phrase, everyone everywhere. That's what Jesus told them to do. That was their assignment. That was, that's what they were to give the rest of their lives doing. And my friends, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what our lives are about, telling everyone everywhere, both as a church community, but also as individuals. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Of course, I hear people say, oh, but I don't have a seminary degree and I don't know the Bible very well. Just tell your story. You know that better than anyone else on earth. You know your story. You tell what he has done for you. That's God's message to people in a hurting world who need to hear about him. So he said, go tell the world and preach the good news to everyone everywhere. And then if you jump down to verse 20, you see something interesting. The disciples went everywhere preaching. So this is one of the times they actually did what Jesus told them to do. Isn't it great? Sometimes we actually obey him. And look what his response was to their obedience. The Lord was with them and confirmed what they said by the miracles that followed their messages. And I think miracles follow obedience. When you get out there and you do what God's called you to do, it's amazing how he will bless your life. I hate it when I hear someone say, I know I'm sinning and I don't care. Oh, my goodness, those are very tragic words because God is not going to bless that. In fact, God may just remove his blessing from that person's life. We need to be out there listening to him and obeying him. And I'm telling you, these are his last words, and we're to obey to go everyone and everywhere. And isn't it interesting that God touched John Wesley and George Whitfield and said, get out there, get outside the doors of the church, go where the people are and preach the gospel, preach the good news of Jesus. Take the message into the streets, into the communities where people are. And that's what we're doing today with our Beyond campaign. We're taking this message of boldness, of salvation, of hope to the people. Now, how many of y'all have a picture in your billfold of someone you love? Anybody? All right, get it out right now. Pull out your billfold, your purse, whatever, and open it up and pull out one or two pictures of somebody that you love. Now, I have a picture here of my son. Uh, I like it because he's in his cap and gown, and I paid a lot of money to get him in his cap and gown four years of money. And um, so pull out that picture. And I want you to take a few minutes and just share that with somebody you're sitting next to. Show them the picture, turn around, whatever, lean over, and show someone a picture of someone you love, if you have one, and just tell them who it is. Real quick, take 30 seconds. Okay, good. I hear lots of happy sounds. 
That sounded like you had a good time doing that. Now let me ask you this question. How many of those people are actively involved in a church? Is, is anyone in your picture not involved in a church? Okay, some are and some aren't. Um, is every person in your pictures a committed follower of Jesus Christ? If someone would go to their towns wherever they live and start an exciting, successful new venue, something that didn't seem like the boring church that they remember or that they heard about, something that seemed new and engaging, would you be for that? If that church would reach out to them and pull them in and help them connect with Jesus and have a vital relationship, would you be for that? Would you want to be involved in that? That's what we're doing with the Beyond Campaign. I hope some of those people lived in Crestview, but that's who we're going to. We're going to a community that's bursting out of the seams, to a place where there's a lot of spiritual vacuum, and we're going to establish, we already have established a new venue, and we see that God has blessed our obedience with literally miracles because he's touching and expanding the kingdom so rapidly we can hardly keep up with it. We're all running so fast to stay ahead of the curve of new people coming all the time. And we're taking that same DNA that we've planted at St. Mark and now we're taking it to North Crestview. Because God says in a scripture, Jesus says, take this message to everyone everywhere. And everywhere means our county. Everywhere means someone else, someplace else, other than just right here in our circles. And I hope and pray that the multi-site movement takes off across America, as it appears to be doing now, and that a venue, that a church, that a campus of a successful church will be planted near that person that you love, near them, and that the Holy Spirit will use that situation to pull them into the church and to help them begin developing a relationship with Jesus Christ. Parents, grandparents, children, brothers, sisters, that's what our vision is. That's what we're looking beyond for, out of obedience to the Scripture, out of obedience to Christ. You know, uh, Niceville's had a really good history of being a come here church. We do all we can to open our doors wide, to let people know that we care about them. No perfect people allowed. You and I wouldn't be here if they were only perfect people. And we love on people. We meet them where they are. We try to help them connect with Christ and then connect in small groups and then grow as believers. We do a really good job being a come-to church, but we need to become a go-to church. And I think we started that process when we began our Supper on Saturday ministry. We didn't realize it would turn into the huge ministry that it is right now, serving over 1,200 meals every Saturday afternoon, connecting with people who are marginalized, who are estranged from churches. We didn't know that, but that's what God did with that passion to become a go-to church rather than just a come here church. There are many people who will never walk inside these doors. It's too intimidating. It's too hard. It just is. We've got to go to them, make friendships, make relationships, connect with them, and then bring them to us. And that's what we're doing in South Crestview and North Crestview. We're going to them and we're opening doors where those people are, where we can help them connect. Now, I think uh, we can look at a great organization that's doing something very well. I read in Business Insider last night that McDonald's has over 34,000 stores in the world now. 34,000, that's a lot. It said that during a three-year period, they will build a store every day in the nation of China. Three years, one a day, 365 days. That's nearly, a, that's over a thousand churches, uh, uh, McDonald's. Yeah, wish, we wish. Uh, one in eight, one in every eight Americans has worked some time in a McDonald's. Is that not incredible? The only place in the lower 48 states that's over a 100-mile drive from McDonald's is a barren plain in South Dakota. Those poor people. 
<clears throat> they've, they think they've topped 300 billion hamburgers right now. They got so big they've stopped counting. They couldn't keep up with it anymore. You know, remember they used to have that, that sign, so many billion and counting, and it changed all the time. Forget it. Can't even keep up with it now. And here's the statistic that blew me over. When a questionnaire was done and they, they queried people all over the globe, more people were able to identify the golden arches than they were able to identify the symbol of our faith, the cross. Yes, this comes from Sponsorship Research International. They found that 88% could tell you what the golden arches was. It had to do with McDonald's and it had to do with fast food, hamburgers and chili and even oatmeal. But only 54% could identify the cross as the symbol of the Christian faith. We got to learn something from McDonald's. We got to get out there and figure out what they're doing. They got it. Do we have it? Now, there was a, a little guy back in 1954 who opened the first McDonald's store. His name was Ray Kroc. And if Ray had been satisfied with his one little store in California, and if he had said, you know, I'm here, I serve a great hamburger, anybody that wants one can come get one. You and I would still think that McDonald's was an old farmer on, you know, E-I-E-I-O kind of thing. But now McDonald's is all over the globe because of the multi-site franchise idea. This is working well. We got a great product. People love it. Let's build another one 10 miles over here and another one 10 miles over here. And, then, and that's what we're doing. We have a great product. We have figured out how to reach people for Christ. We've got a good, healthy DNA, a good, healthy church. Let's take that and see if that will work in another place. And guess what it did? And since it did, and now we're all confident that it works, let's take that and let's take that to another place. And that's what the Beyond Campaign is all about. Now, I know many of you came this morning planning and preparing to make your commitment this Sunday to the Beyond Campaign. We just were concerned about what Karen would do, the, her, the tropical storm. So that decision had to be made a couple days ago, but that was put off until next Sunday. So I just ask you, come back next Sunday. Make sure you're here next Sunday. This is a great crowd, but we would have missed some people today. And be part of this Commitment Sunday as we decide how we will exactly be involved with the Beyond Campaign. McDonald's got it. We've got to have it too. John Wesley had it. Jesus had it. His disciples had it. Now, a bunch of us on staff are reading this book right now called The Multi-Site Church Revolution. And I encourage you, if you're particularly interested and want to know more about this, that you buy this book from Amazon.com and read it yourself. It is excellent. It's teaching us and training us how to do what God has given us a vision to do. And so um, I just want to share with you a little bit about what I learned. Because before I got involved at St. Mark, I knew very little about multi-sites. I knew that they existed. And I knew that healthy growing churches were planting sites in other locations, and that's about it. So let me share with you just a few things that I have learned that I think uh, you might enjoy knowing about too. People will drive uh, 30 minutes to go to a church, and we have many people that drive to Niceville UMC from Shalimar, Fort Walton Beach, Destin, even Crestview. But what statistics show is those people are very reticent to invite an unchurched friend because they think it's too far to drive, okay? So those people are coming, but they're not bringing people with them. Also, those persons who have to drive so far are less likely to be involved in midweek church, are less likely to have their children involved in the children's ministry. They're not in small groups unless there is a small group in their region or area, and they're just not that involved in the life of the church, so they're not having the opportunity to grow like they should. So 30 minutes or more is a long distance, but what we found is if we take ourselves to somewhere near them, people get involved. We've seen this at St. Mark. It is just, it tickles me. A lot of Sundays we'll be sitting there and doing church and someone we recognize from the Niceville campus walks in. They live in Crestview. They're on their way to church here. They're running late. They say, well, let's, let's not be late. Let's just go there. Let's go to St. Mark. And they walk in the door and they love it. And they're like, hey, this is just like, what's at Niceville? Same great children's program, the bulletin looks the same, same videos, same people we know. In fact, there's, there's the guy sitting next to a nice little sitting over there on the pew, you know. So there's, there's just a lot of that and they get in there, they get comfortable, they love it, it's close to home, they can get involved 
And that's one of the things that's helped us grow because we have so many people in Crestview who come to this church. The second thing is multi-site allows us to use paradoxical options. Now by paradoxical options, what I mean is that <clears throat> when you have a decision to make, you have option A and you have option B. And a lot of times they're very, very different and you can't have both. But with a multi-site, you can have both. Let me share with you some examples. In a multi-site situation, you can grow larger and grow smaller at the same time. A lot of people like a smaller venue. We have people who are familiar with our church here and they come to that campus and they say, it's exactly like Niceville, only it's smaller, it's more intimate, I like it. You know? And then there are other people who prefer the larger situation. But we can have both, both worlds, with a multi-site situation. Another one is, you can offer brand new as well as tried and true. Now how many of y'all when you do your shopping at the grocery store, you see a brand new item and it just looks enticing so you buy it only because it's brand new. Some people do that. I don't. I always buy the same old stuff because I've discovered I like it. And when I buy something brand new, I think, gee, that's not as good as what I already have. I wasted my money on that. So you got your brand new people and you got your tried and true people. We have both in a multi-site situation. We have the tried and true here. We take it, we plant it elsewhere. We have tried and true and brand new. Love it. We can do more with less in a multi-site campus situation. Um, if we were to engage 500 more people here on this campus, it would involve a huge building program. It would involve us uh, begging, pleading for more land, which we already are doing, uh, building a, more buildings, starting another venue. And we can take that same thing. We can reach 500 people in Crestview with a lot less money because it's there, land is cheaper. There are venues there that we can uh, use, borrow, share. So that works. We can move there and stay here. That's what I love about it. How many of y'all have ever been a change, have been ever assigned to move to a new place and you're excited to go, but you also didn't want to go? You wanted to go there, but you wanted to stay here? We can do that. We can do that on a multi-site campus. We will stay here and keep doing ministry here in this place, but we'll also keep going there. How exciting. Oh, I just love it. The best of both worlds. We can offer that new church vibe as well as that big church punch. There's just a lot of people who want to be part of the latest, greatest, newest thing that's happening. But then there's the person who says, you know, I like the punch of a, of a larger church. When Rule and I go on vacation and we go to a town or a city, one of the things we do is ask around and we say this, what's the biggest church in town? Now, why do we go to the biggest church in town? Because the biggest church in town is doing something right or it wouldn't be the biggest church in town. And we want to go there and see what they're doing right and see if we can learn something from them and see if we can have a wonderful worship experience ourselves. Well, a big church just gives a great punch. But when we take that strength, that great punch, and we put it into a smaller venue in another campus, we have the best of both worlds. We have the new vibe situation, the cool newest thing happening, as well as the great stuff that we're already known for. So it's, it's such a beneficial thing to have a multi-site setting. Uh, when you start a multi-site in a new community, there's a vacuum where God allows new leaders to raise up. It's been very fun at St. Mark to watch God raise up new leaders. We'll have someone that, that comes in the church and they meet Christ and the next week they're over all the ushers and greeters on campus. Why? Because we're desperate. We gotta have somebody. You know, if you're a warm body and you're organized, we're gonna put you in charge of something, you know, because we need someone. So a new setting offers a vacuum, offers a venue for new leadership to rise up. Now Bryce and I are always looking over the congregation, looking over our new people and saying, who do we see is gifted for leadership? We're gonna tag them, train them, put them in place. But I tell you what else happens. People just jump in and start serving. And we're sitting there observing this and watching this and saying, oh my gosh, they have organizational skills. Oh my gosh, they have teaching gifts. Oh my goodness, they have the gift of service or mercy or generosity. We're seeing those and we need those people with those gifts. So we plug them in and they have an opportunity to grow in a new setting, in a new venue. So that's another great thing about a multi-site situation.
And then the last thing I want to share with you about multi-sites is the 10 largest churches in the United States, nine of them out of 10 do multi-site. And some of them have many multi-sites, as many as 15, 17, and 20. I don't know if we'll ever get that, that big. We're always just doing the next thing of ministry. But multi-sites are working. It's a movement. It's a revolution. We think God has called us to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> do we want to be big? Is that our goal? No. Our goal is to reach more people for Jesus Christ. Help them connect with him, find salvation, grow as Christians, become mature believers, walking a life of holiness, living a life of discipleship. That is our goal, connecting people to Christ. And we think we can do that through multi-sites. So I just thank you this morning for getting on board with our Beyond campaign, our movement to go multi-site. We just kind of happened. We just kind of fell into it at St. Mark. We didn't go up there to be a multi-site. We went up there to serve those people. And God blessed that obedience with great miracles. And it's been wonderful to see how that's blossomed out. And we know now we've gotten enough confidence that we can now do that in another location. So please come next Sunday. It's so important that we're all here this Sunday. And your assignment this week is to go home and pray and ask God, what does he want you and your family to do? What does he want you to pledge? What commitment does he want you to make? And all that we ask is that you obey him, whatever he shows you. But we can promise you this, when God's people obey him, he blesses that. When God's church obeys him, he blesses that. I want you to receive the blessing that comes through total obedience. And I want us as the body of Christ to receive the blessing that comes through total obedience. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, we're just so honored and thankful that you've called us to be part of this multi-site revolution that's taking America by storm. We pray for the many people who are without Christ at this moment, our own brothers and sisters and children and grandchildren and, and parents and aunts and uncles somewhere. And we pray, Lord, that someone will do something to reach out to them and engage them and pull them in to a relationship with Jesus Christ, which will change their eternity. Thank you that you've shown us the way, that you've given us as a church this vision, and help us to be faithful and available and teachable as we forge ahead to do your will. We want to be used. We want to glorify you. We want to honor your holy name. Amen. Thank you for listening to our message today. I hope that you've been inspired to act upon what you've just heard and become a doer of the Word. Feel free to contact us through the information on the screen or through our website. Better yet, if you're ever in the Niceville, Florida area, feel free to stop by and visit us at the Niceville United Methodist Church.